Okay, the Socratic arguments for the immortality of the soul have a, uh, probably they're best classified as being in the realm of natural revelation. Okay, so in the Christian tradition, there are two forms of knowledge about God and about matters of ultimate importance. There is natural revelation and then there is special revelation. Okay, natural revelation is knowledge about God, so Christian uh, philosophers and theologians have argued. Natural revelation is knowledge about God that is available to all persons. So all persons, regardless of their point of view, regardless of their starting points in life, as long as their cognitive capacities are functioning correctly, they can know certain things about God on this view. Well, what can they know? Um, they can look at the natural word, world around them, and they can know that there was a creator for all this. And they can know also that that creator is a complex, intelligent being. Because the world around us is quite clearly complex. Incredibly so. Unbelievably so. Uh, and the levels of complexity become greater and greater and greater the further we go into uh, small and large scientific realms. Okay, so on natural revelation, there are certain things we can know about God, about ultimate matters, which all persons can know because it's available to all persons. Okay, in Christian theology and philosophy, there's also, though, special revelation. Special revelation is knowledge about God and matters of ultimate importance that is specially revealed, only available to some, not to all. Okay, and in particular, it's only available to those who have received the special revelation. Um, an example of special revelation is the scriptures. Okay, so for instance, I believe God is three persons. I would not know this by looking at the natural world. Okay, um, instead I know this because I am told this in a special revelation revelation. Okay, the personhood of God is something that is only available to those who have received a special revelation. Um, another example would be the incarnation uh, of Jesus of Nazareth. There's some other similar sort of spiritual um, uh, kind of a, a, a truth or a doctrine or a principle. Okay, now all of Socrates' arguments for the immortality of the soul and the pseudo fall under the specification natural revelation. He thinks that all persons everywhere if they use their cognitive faculty successfully, can understand if they follow his arguments that their souls are immortal. Okay, here's a quick spoiler alert. I actually am unconvinced by all of Socrates' arguments in the Phaedo. Okay, I don't think... So I do agree with Socrates that my soul is immortal. I think his is as well. I do not think that my soul is immortal on the basis of the arguments that Socrates offers in the Phaedo. Okay, at any rate, though, uh, what are these arguments? Let me stop and ask, though, if there are questions or comments so far about any of the things we've been saying. You know, there are some people who think that uh, souls are an illusion. We don't actually have a non-physical aspect to ourselves. They tend to be people who are uh, skeptical about uh, non-empirical or non-visible kinds of things, about the existence of such things. Uh, but there, there, are, there are a number of people. They tend, to, they tend to be atheist types, but not always. There are a number of people who think that uh, your feeling that you have a first-person conscious self that's different than just physical stuff is a feeling that is a fiction, actually. It supervenes upon the physical. It's not actually a real thing. Anyway, just FYI. Okay, um, natural revelation arguments for the, uh, did I put revolution up there? Please, folks, help, help a brother out. <laughs> I think it must have been when I was talking. Uh, it's hard to talk and write on, on, at the, on the board at the same time. That's like telling somebody he's got a booger in his nose. You're like, you just sort of like help someone out. Like you're being a friend. <laughs> okay, um. 
Okay, so natural revelation. First argument, the recycling argument. Okay, there's this extensive discussion in the Phaedo about uh, whether the soul will survive the death of the body. And Socrates is encountering uh, others, who his companions, who say, well, look, um, if someone doesn't, that maybe the soul just sort of dissipates upon the death of the body. And Socrates says, no, the key is you've got to like prep your soul. You've got to, uh, you've got to uh, deny it certain physical pleasures so it doesn't become overly attached to the body. And in the course of this discussion, they settle upon an argument, and I dub it the recycling argument. This argument is just an argument where um, they're talking about hot coming from cold and vice versa, uh, night from day, and waking from sleeping. And basically, the gist of the argument, as I understand it, is things get recycled. If we look around us in the world, it becomes clear upon inspection that when stuff passes out of its current state of affairs, its current existence, it doesn't cease to be entirely. Rather, it just ceases to be what it currently is. So this building, for instance, that we're sitting in right now, this will one day be a pile of rubble. Okay, but at the same time, this building is not going to cease to be entirely, it's going to get recycled. Okay, it's going to become something else, just different in kind than what it currently is. Um, your car is not going to cease to be entirely when it goes to the junkyard. It will just get recycled as something else. And so Socrates reasons, well, since everything else we see around us gets recycled, why wouldn't the soul get recycled as well? And uh, I remain unconvinced by this argument. I don't find this to be a convincing argument because I think what Socrates is doing is he is making a category error. Okay, if you watch the lecture from Monday, I mentioned in the lecture that Socrates is a dualist. He subscribes to dualism. And on dualism, humans are two things. Humans are souls and bodies. That is the definition of what it is to be a human being, a soul and a body. Okay, and I think what Socrates is doing is he is taking the characteristics of bodies, namely that they get recycled, physical things get recycled. And he's ascribing those characteristics to souls and saying souls exhibit similar characteristics. But why should we say that if the soul is a different kind of thing in substance than the body? Okay, uh, and Socrates does seem to think uh, that souls and bodies are fundamentally different things that come packaged together in the human being. The soul inhabits the body, even though the two sides of the human are different in kind from each other. Okay, um, so I think a category error is being made, and I think characteristics of bodies are being ascribed to souls. Questions or comments about that argument? Okay, there is another argument, the argument from simplicity. Um, I'm running short on time today. Uh, so I, I'm just going to list it here and maybe I'll upload a, um, a sheet to Blackboard to describe that argument. I want to, uh, to move on, uh, but let me just reference that. And then there are a couple of other arguments for the immortality of the soul. Okay, uh, if you'll open up your text, there is a key statement at the end of the dialogue that is important for uh, describing Plato's overall views about the nature of life and the nature of death. Okay, and it's on my page 155. Um, on this, in the sides of the dialogue, there are Stephanus numbers. Okay, these numbers uh, can help us uh, see where we are, even if we have different editions. So I'm looking at Stephanus number 118. And uh, Socrates is drinking hemlock at the end of the dialogue, which is poison. He's being executed. Um, he was convicted of dishonoring the gods and corrupting the youth. It was trumped up political charges. They were false. But he's being executed. Okay, and he says here... Um, well, I'll just read here. Uh, his words made us ashamed, and we checked our tears. He walked around, and when he said his legs were heavy, he lay on his back as he had been told to do. 
and the man who had given him the poison touched his body, etc., etc. Um, as his belly was getting cold, Socrates uncovered his head. He had covered it and said these were, were his last words. Crito, we owe a cock to Asclepius. Make this offering and do not forget. It shall be done, said Crito. Tell us if there is anything else, but there was no answer. Okay, shortly afterwards, Socrates made a movement. The man uncovered him and his eyes were fixed, seeing this Crito closed his mouth and his eyes. Okay, um, why does he say, Crito, we owe a, clock, a cock to Asclepius. Make this offer to him and do not forget. What is he trying to imply by that? Look in the footnotes. He is trying to imply that death is a medicine which heals us from life. Now remember that for later this semester when we cover Nietzsche. Okay? Socrates is trying to imply that death is a medicine or a cure for the ills of life. Okay? And what Plato is seeming, uh, seems to imply more generally by means of this dialogue is that um, it is secondary to be in the body and the primary existence or the better existence is elsewhere outside of the body. Physical existence in this world is existence that is always mitigated or limited or in some way diminished, whereas the better existence, the better way, exists otherwise in the realm of the forms. Okay, um, that sort of thinking, that two worlds thinking, where there is this world and there is another world, is very influential as a way of viewing the universe and our lives in it down through the centuries. There is this world, and then there is another world, and the other world is superior to this world. The other world is the real thing, and this world is merely a shadow or a secondary, a place of secondary status. Okay, does that not sound like something else? Does that not sound like Christianity? Okay, it does sound, I think, like Christianity. I believe that heaven is a better place than what we've got here. Okay, my, in my belief system, this place is, although very important, it is secondary to or diminished or a shadow, a mere shadow of the, the more real or the greater reality that is elsewhere. Okay, and that kind of thinking is present in the Greek tradition as well, and you can see it in what Socrates says here at the end of the dialogue. Okay, um, now I wanted to get to a couple things in the Crito today so we can wrap up Plato. Uh, so let me reference these things uh, here. Um, the Crito, if you open up your text, is a dialogue where uh, Socrates is given a chance to escape shortly before we see him get executed in the Phaedo. Okay, a dude named Crito comes and offers him an opportunity to leave Athens to escape the fate that awaits him as soon as the ship returns from Delos and his sentence of execution is uh, destined to be carried out. Okay, and in the Crito, Socrates refuses this offer to escape. Okay, he uh, refuses to leave. And the argument that he makes for why he wants to stay rather than leave, even though he has been falsely charged with crimes of uh, corrupting the youth and dishonoring the gods, the argument why he wants to stay rather than leave has uh, come to be very famous, and it has been an important and influential idea in philosophy ever since. Okay, um, if you look on page 52 in my text, this is Stephanus number 50a, I'm looking at 50A in the Crito. Socrates offers this argument, and I want to take about 10 minutes here at the end of class to uh, cover this famous argument. Okay, again, just to summarize, this is the argument that Socrates makes for why he will not leave Athens. He wants to stay and uh, accept the city's uh, uh, determination that he should die for the, quote, crimes that he has committed. Uh, even though they are false charges. So uh, Socrates says, see what follows from this. If we leave here um, without the city's permission, are we injuring people whom we should at least injure? And are we sticking to a just agreement or not? 
Crito says, I cannot answer your question, Socrates, I do not know. Bear with me, I'm going to read a little bit here. Socrates says, look at it this way. If, as we were planning to run away from here, or whatever one should call it, the laws in the state came and confronted us and asked, tell me, Socrates, what are you intending to do? Do you not, by this action you are attempting, intend to destroy us, the laws, and indeed the whole city as far as you are concerned? Or do you think it possible for a city not to be destroyed if the verdicts of its courts have no force but are nullified and set at naught by private individuals? What shall we answer to this and other such arguments? For many things could be said, etc. Um, moving on, Socrates says, Then what if the law said, Was that the agreement between us, Socrates, or was it to respect the judgments that the city came to? And if we wondered at their words, they would perhaps add, Socrates, do not wonder at what we say, but answer since you are accustomed to proceed. Okay, um, did we not first bring you to birth, and was it not through us that your father married your mother and begat you? Tell us, do you find anything to criticize in those of us who are concerned with marriage? And I would say that I do not criticize them, or in those of us concerned here with the nurture of babies and the education that you two received, were those assigned to that subject not right to instruct your father to educate you in the arts and in physical culture, etc., etc. Okay? The same kinds of reasons are offered throughout that extensive speech. What Socrates is arguing there is that the reason why he cannot leave Athens, the reason why he cannot escape, is because the city of Athens has raised him. It has nurtured him okay, through his parents, through the education system, through a variety of different cultural inputs. The city of Athens has raised him. Okay, and by virtue of that, he is obligated to do what the city of Athens expects him to do. If the city of Athens had asked him to go to war on its behalf as a soldier, he would be obligated to do that by virtue of what the city has done for him. And in this case, if the city of Athens asks him to die, it renders a, a verdict of guilty and, and execution is the sentence that he is obligated to do that because the city of Athens has done so much for him. And this view of the legitimacy of government is known as the contract view or the contractual account. of society. And the core idea in this view that Socrates seems to be offering is that the individual, I'll just say individual, not Socrates, the individual is in a contract with the city-state like Athens or the country in which the individual is located. And the individual has certain obligations to the country because the country has engaged in certain obligations to the individual. Okay, so um, for instance, let's think about this in terms of us as citizens of the United States. What are our obligations as individual citizens to the land in which we are located? What do those obligations, what constitute those obligations? There are certain obligations, right? Taxes, yeah. What else? Yeah, absolutely. If a draft were to take place, you would be a... Um, I think it might actually now. I think that I think that that has just changed, and I think women can get drafted. Am I correct in saying that, ladies? <laughs> no, 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 I think you can get drafted now. Yeah, um, which, I mean, I know we're doing equality in all things, but, you know, whatever. I got three little girls, and I don't want them to get drafted. I'll put it that way. <laughs> Maybe they could become medics. Okay, anyway, um, all right, so individuals and countries, taxes are an obligation, draft, um, I'll add to that. Uh, you have to abide by the laws. You can't exert vigilante justice against those who have wronged you. Well, we're in Texas, so I suppose you can do something like that, but it can't go that far. Um, jury duty, good, yeah. Maybe some others as well. Okay, in return, what do you get? Yeah. 
protection from external enemies, right? So if, uh, oh, I don't know. Let me pick a country that's like far off. If, uh, if Vietnam were to attack us, <laughs> right? You would get protection from them, okay? But also internal enemies too. So protection from your fellow citizens, what else do you get from the country? Infrastructure, right? Roads, transportation. That's good. A sense of freedom. Okay. Huh. So I hadn't heard. I hadn't thought of that before. So like a cultural ethos or something is what you get. Okay, all right. Um, good, okay. Uh, other things that you get? Education. Yeah, I mean, most of us came up through the public schools, right? Yeah. And, you know, maybe you didn't like your public school experience. <laughs> um, many people don't. But you got it. So the, the government did give you something. So um, the question then is, are we in a contract with the land in which we are located? Just like Socrates says he was in a contract with the city of Athens. Is that what provides legitimacy to the coercive actions of the government? When the government coerces us to do something, like it sometimes does from time to time, is it legitimate for the government to do that given that it has given us things? which seems to be Socrates' reasoning. Socrates says, in a contract, you give and you get. And when the government has given us things, the city of Athens gave him his education, his upbringing, he is now obliged in return to give as a response when the government asks him to die. Okay, um, would you die for America? Depends on the situation. If it's as long as the, the war is just or something like that, or the cause is just. But if it's like an imperial event, venture or something to protect the oil reserves, maybe not. Okay. Okay. Would you die for America if asked? Here's another question while you think about that one. Are you in a contract? That's what Socrates seems to think. Good point. I never signed a contract. Do you remember signing a contract? I sure don't remember one. So are we in a contract? Right? Most of us here are citizens. We became citizens by birth, most of us, and it just kind of happened. Like the infant doesn't sign a contract, it's just de the infant is declared a citizen. Well, are you in a contract? Because it could be argued that you are in an implicit contract and that you have agreed to the terms of the contract by virtue of having spent your whole life in these circumstances accepting the largesse, the goods of the society given to you. You could leave, right? But you choose to stay. So maybe you're in an implicit contract, even if you're not in an explicit one. That's cool, Kenneth. Um, if you dislike the contract, why don't you leave tomorrow? But you won't, right? <laughs> it's nice to be on the side of maybe the most powerful country in the world, isn't it? Yeah. It's good to have, have, you know, if one's going to be in a contract, that it's good to be on the side of, of that country. Um, yeah, so the counter-argument to the implicit contract interpretation is that... Uh, is that, yes, although you could potentially 
Although there is a contract and you could potentially leave, still it's very hard to leave. And for most people, it's not a live option. So it's a forced arrangement rather than a genuine consensual contract, like a business agreement or something. Okay, um, at any rate, Socrates thinks he's in a contract. And Socrates thinks that that contract is the reason why he's got to stay and ultimately in the Phaedo be executed for his views. I would argue against Socrates. I actually disagree with him. I would argue that when the state um, convicted him on unjust charges, it broke the contract. If the charges had been just and he knew them to be just, he would be obligated to stay and be executed. But I think he could have left, and justifiably so, because the charges were unjust. Now, that's a dangerous position to take, because if all the criminals in the United States all started asserting that their charges, the charges that were brought against them were unjust, so they don't have to accept the sentence, then that's a problem. But in Socrates' case, the charges really were unjust, and arguably there is a natural justice that's deeper than the law of the land. And if the law of the land conflicts with that natural justice, then it's the law of the land that's wrong. Okay, but that's a topic for another day. Okay, um, questions on the contractual view of society, on why Socrates decided to stay and be executed in the Phaedo, or more generally on whether you are in a contract with, uh, with the United States. Evelyn. Yeah. Yeah, so the implicit contract argument asserts that although none of us ever actually explicitly signed a contract, still we are in an implicit contract with the state because we have accepted all of the goods that it has offered us. We've never questioned them or you know, left, which would have suggested we disagreed with them. Now, um, the counter argument to the implicit contract view is that uh, it's actually, there are very high costs to leaving. You leave your family and friends. We speak English, so there are other places you can go and speak English, but if you're in a country where your language and your country is not spoken elsewhere, that's a really high cost that you have to deal with if you try to immigrate. Uh, there are monetary costs, right? So not only are there emotional and relational costs leaving family and friends, there are also monetary costs to leaving. So the counter argument to the implicit contract view is that actually it is forced because the barriers to leaving are so high. It would be so difficult for most of us actually in practice to leave for what it's worth. Does that answer your question a little bit? Good. Great. Good, good. Thank you all for a wonderful class session today. Um,